In today's video, we're going to talk through and discuss the rules for the 9th edition Crusade game mode. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So another area in 9th edition where Games Workshop seems to have invested significant effort is this new Crusade game mode. It's basically a game designed for narrative play using power levels, and I think its main aim is to make narrative games a little bit more accessible, and to have a narrative game mode with people, even if you haven't invested loads of effort in making a big campaign or something. The general idea is that you keep a Crusade army going, and the battles that you fight with it allow certain units to gain different abilities, or maybe get injured, and generally encourage you to create a bit of a backstory and a feel for your certain miniatures, and maybe form a bit more of an attachment to certain characters and units more than you might do in a normal game of 40k. In this video we'll talk through all of the rules of the Crusade game mode, with some thoughts along the way as to how they might work in practice. So as an introduction to the narrative play Crusade mode part of the big rulebook, Games Workshop describes it as perhaps the most engaging comprehensive narrative game mode, and honestly there do seem to have been more rules, effort and thought put into this mode compared with virtually any narrative play games that I've seen in the past from Games Workshop themselves. I think it's important to note that narrative play does imply people are kind of expected to use a certain mindset, and if you're more about list optimization, then it's probably better to go for match play. I don't doubt that you could build some very scary crusade armies if you were just looking to get the strongest rules into your army, whether it's just by getting the strongest traits and abilities from the various tables in this book, or by gaming the power level a little bit, such as maximising the fancy gear that you take on every single unit, which would likely give you an advantage. Despite any gripes about the balance of match play itself, narrative play will potentially have even more imbalance, so I think it's important that both players go into the mindset of a crusade game mode, trying to focus on building a narrative and story, rather than purely playing games to win, or just level up their crusade army into some sort of death machine. Compared with other narrative game modes, I do quite like the idea that basically all of your games of 40k can be somewhat linked up, it can certainly add a lot more depth to the units in your army. And it's also good that you don't have to be playing with the exact same gaming group every single time, which you might need to if you were playing a campaign for example. As for disadvantages, I think you will lose at least some of the custom rules made by a properly crafted campaign, and just playing random crusade missions one after another might not give you quite as good a narrative as that experience, and also I feel that with these crusade rules, you will likely have less balanced games than if you just use the standard say points or power level, as it's only likely to increase the disparities between armies despite their crusade point balancing system. Overall though, after reading the rules, I do feel that the crusade pack will provide a fun framework for narrative games. So the Crusade game mode starts by drawing up an order of battle. Each one is drawn from one of the 40k super factions, that's Imperium, Chaos, Eldari, Tyranids, Orcs, Necrons or Tau. So basically you can be really quite de-restrictive, if you did want to have an army with some Ultramarines with some Astra Militarum in another detachment, then that would be perfectly achievable. You can also buy in unaligned units too, such as fortifications. At the start of the order of battle, you start with 50 power level, and you get 5 requisition points for free. These are the points that you can spend to add in additional units, or buy in extra abilities such as warlord traits for your units, as we'll cover a little bit more in depth later. You basically spend these power level on different units that you want to include in your order of battle. For each unit that you add in, you write down their stats and war gear and their name on a crusade card, you can add and remove units from the order of battle at any point. I believe if you really wanted to, you could basically switch out most of your army for an entirely different order of battle, though of course this would slightly defeat the point of levelling up your units and gaining additional experience, as the new units would start with nothing again. When you play individual games, you pick units out of this 50 power level order of battle, and select the ones that you want for the given mission. And you can also spend requisition points to increase the size of this order of battle, so you have more selections to choose from. They encourage you to recall the amount of battles that you've fought, why your army is on crusade, and any additional fluff or notable achievements that your crusade has achieved. On the right is an example of an order of battle that Games Workshop previewed in a Warhammer community article. This one's a sister of battle army with various different named units and characters. I believe that some of these sheets are available in that crusade handbook, though I don't see why you couldn't make your own very easily. Turning our attention to the individual unit crusade cards, you basically have to fill out one of these each time you add a unit to your order of battle, which is a little bit of admin to be fair. They say each unit has to be given its own unique name, which I think is quite a nice little touch. I think by naming the unit, it does mean that you can attach more significance to them. You have to declare the number of war gear and models at the start, and you can't change this unless you spend requisition points on it. All traits, relics and psychic powers are also set and recorded on these cards, and you do have to spend requisition points to buy in warlord traits and relics for them. 
Each unit has a number of crusade points recorded on it. This represents the number of additional abilities that it has gained during the course of the crusade, and it's sort of used as a balancing mechanic for if you're playing with two different crusade armies, there are vastly different levels of experience. Also on the card, you will record the number of experience points, which are used to unlock unit ranks, which are in turn used to unlock battle honors, different abilities that the unit might have in-game. If they get injured over the course of action, you'll also record battle scars here. And they also encourage you to record things like the number of games that unit has taken part in, the number of games that they've survived, and the number of enemy units that they've killed over the course of their tour of action. I believe that these are just for fun though, and don't actually matter in terms of the rules for the most part. In terms of these experience points, generally a unit will gain an experience point for every battle that it's taken part in, even if it might have been destroyed. For every three enemy units that the unit has destroyed, you also gain one experience point, and at the end of each battle you may select one unit that's marked for greatness, and that unit is randomly given an extra three experience points, so you can level up some units a little bit faster if you think they're really distinguishing themselves. As with most of the other things for leveling up your army, some mission objectives or secret agendas can give you experience points, which gives you some additional incentives to achieving certain objectives within the missions. It's also worth noting that you can't ever gain experience points on things like swarms, drones, fortifications, named characters, or summoned units. Experience points are what gain you ranks, which is on the table on the right. When they get 6 or more experience points, they will be blooded, then 15 or more to get battle hardened, 30 or more to get heroic, and 50 plus to get legendary. Each time you gain a rank, you can gain a battle honor, which basically amounts to an increased ability. Each time you gain a battle honor, you can choose from four different upgrades, either battle traits that directly upgrade the unit in question, weapon enhancements that directly upgrade one of the unit's weapons, psychic fortitudes which make them better psychers, or crusade relics which are a big list of generic relics that you can add on to your character and give them other powerful abilities. Again, with these battle honors, you might be able to acquire some through specific mission objectives. Each unit can acquire a maximum of six of these battle honors, by which time they're probably going to be quite scary indeed. Each battle honor gained adds one to your crusade points for your list, and for each crusade point that you have more than your opponent, they will get that amount of command points when you actually play missions, which at least in theory should go some way to balancing one army having loads of these battle honors, and maybe one army having very few. In terms of the battle honors themselves, the first are battle traits. There are four tables for these, one for most units in the game, one for characters, one for monsters, and one for vehicles. You can either roll a d6 for these traits, or just literally choose the one that you want. They seem to ask you to pick the one that makes the most narrative sense, though I'm sure a lot of people will be very tempted just to pick the strongest. On the right you can see the table for most units. You can get Fleet of Foot, which is plus one to move, plus one to advance, and plus one to charge. Veteran Warriors, for re-rolling hit rolls of one. Grizzled, for a six plus fail no pain type save. Headhunters, for plus one to hit and wound against characters. Cool Headed, for re-rolling morale tests, and also being able to fire Overwatch all the time and battle tested for objectives secured, and passing combat attrition tests when they're within a certain range of an objective. The other tables are at least fairly similar, with some minor differences such as say monsters getting at 1 4 plus 1 attack on the charge, and for example the one on the movement for vehicles is just plus 2 inches to movement, as they already tend to have quite good movement anyway. Next up we have weapon upgrades. This allows you to upgrade one weapon in a unit. If the unit has a sergeant type leader, then it must be their weapon, which could lock you out of upgrading things like missile launchers or special weapons. You can't stack this more than once on the same weapon, and you can't use it on relics. Again, you can either choose or pick from the ranged and melee weapon tables, but there's some slight restrictions as to which ones you can use. If you're using it on titanic units, then you can only get results 1 to 3 on them. If you're using characters, monsters or vehicles, you can choose one ability from 1 to 6. And for everyone else, they actually get two upgrades on it, where they get to have one of the options from 1 to 3, and one of the options through 1 to 6. I'm sure on certain units with powerful ranged weapons, that could be ridiculously powerful. The two tables are almost identical, with just one major difference. You have the choice of exploding 6s to hit, meaning that each unmodified hit roll of 6 will cause two hits. You can make the AP of the weapon one better. You can add plus one to its strength, plus one to the hit roll, plus one to the damage. And then the one difference is that ranged weapons get plus 6 inches to their range, whereas melee weapons can get always wounds on a 4 plus or better. Could certainly be very powerful on certain weapons. Say for example, if you had a Lehman Rust Punisher tank commander, and you gave its weapon AP-1, that would be very scary. Or maybe take a Space Marine Aggressor Sergeant and give the AP-1 upgrade, and also plus 1 damage. Looks like it's at least fairly well balanced, and they have thought a bit about different unit types. The next option is Psychic Fortitudes, of which any one Psychic can acquire multiple, but can't use the same one more than once. 
I'd say the best one is just being able to cast one additional psychic power, but you can also acquire an extra denial and also knowing an additional psychic power. Finally, we have Crusade Relics, which quite surprisingly you can have in addition to normal relics, and you can also get yourself multiple Crusade Relics on the same character, which slightly surprised me seeing as they're usually quite restrictive about that sort of thing. There's six standard ones, three antiquity ones, and two legendary ones. The antiquity ones are open to everyone. You can have an artificer weapon that causes mortal wounds on sixes to hit, mastercrafted armor for plus one to your saving throw, and a six up feel no pain against mortal wounds. There's the laurels of victory, forged plus two to your command point total, though you do lose two command points when the character dies. A conversion field for a four plus invul save, and if you roll a six to save, then it bounces one mortal wound back at an enemy within one inches. Artisan Bionics for plus one strength and a five plus feel no pain type save, and a friends on injector for re-rolling advance and charge and getting plus one to attacks on the charge. Certainly some very powerful ones on certain characters there. There are then a couple of higher tiers of relics. Antiquity relics can only be taken on heroic rank or better characters, and these ones will cost you two crusade points rather than one, in theory to represent that they're a little bit stronger. Firstly, there's the Xenotech lasers, which are a pistol that fires one shot, but if you hit, it causes D3 mortal wounds on the target. There's an Architect Nano Mez, which allows you to roll a dice when you die, and on a 2+, plus you get up with D3 wounds remaining. Finally, there's a Dark Age Displacer Belt, which allows the character to teleport every turn and set up greater than 9 inches away from the enemy. That one honestly sounds just a little bit daft. It would be really, really scary indeed with certain fighty or shooty characters. Finally, we have the Legendary Relics, which cost 3 Crusade Points, so in theory you will be handing your opponent some command point advantages with this. Firstly, there's the Vortex Grenade, which is a 6-inch single-shot weapon, causing a mighty 3d3 mortal wounds on the primary target, and anyone within 6 inches suffers d3 mortal wounds on the roll of a 4+. Could be pretty cataclysmic, that one. Otherwise, there's also a Norfield Disruptor, which means that your character ignores inball saves. So overall, plenty of ways to upgrade all of your unit's characters and psychers. Let's talk about requisition points now, which are how you add more units and abilities to your army. You gain one at the end of every battle, whether it's a win, draw or loss. And again, you can get even more from winning missions or achieving certain objectives. You do have to spend them rather than just keeping on accumulating them for some reason, as you can't save up more than five, not that there's massive advantage to doing so. There are quite a few options for spending them, all of which cost one requisition point. Maybe we'll see more when the actual individual codexes come out. Firstly, and most basically, you can increase the supply limit for plus 5 power to your order of battle to include some more units. You can expand a squad already in your order of battle by allowing you to add more models to any unit that doesn't have the battle hardened rank or better. You can rearm and resupply to change a unit's war gear, say if you wanted to equip a unit with melter weapons that had flameless for example. You can repair and recuperate, which would heal a battle scar. Could be worth the investment if you had a unit that was already quite veteran and they acquired an unhelpful one. You can use Psychic Meditations to change a Psyker's powers. Specialist Reinforcements can allow you to upgrade a new Crusade card that you've just added to your army with pre game stratagems built into it. Say, for example, in the Blood Angels Codex, you can pay one command point to upgrade your character to be Death Company, and this is how you access that sort of thing in the Crusade mode. The ability is then included in their datasheet for good, and it does cost you Crusade points, which means that you'd add some to your tally, so your opponent would acquire the proportionate amount of command points. Finally, there's Warlord Traits and Relics. It sounds like that in Crusade you can have multiple different Warlords running around with Warlord Traits in every single army, again at the cost of a Crusade point, or two if it's the Titanic model, and I believe that named characters always have theirs active regardless of this, though I might have misunderstood that, the wording is a little bit confusing to me. Finally, again, this is the way that you buy in Relics as well, again at the cost of one Requisition point and one Crusade point permanently. The Relic is from then on just listed on that character's datasheet. You can't have multiple copies of the same relic or warlord trait across your order of battle. If units are killed in a game, then you have a chance of having the unit destroyed. You roll a dice for every unit destroyed, and on a 1 the test is failed, meaning that you either have the choice of them taking a devastating blow or taking a battle scar. You can choose which for each unit. If they suffer a devastating blow, then they gain no experience from the battle, and that unit also loses d6 experience points that they've already acquired, so it would certainly be a setback in terms of ranking them up. If they take a battle scar, however, then again we have four different tables, and again you can either choose the result that you want, or roll a d6 and apply the result. You have six potential negative consequences. The ones for most general units are walking wounded, where they're minus one to move, advance, and charge. Fatigues, where they can't control objective markers. 
Battle Weary, where they can't perform actions and can't gain more than one experience point per battle. Shell Shocked, where they're minus one leadership and minus one combat attrition. Disgraced, where they can't use stratagems or the command point reroll. And Mark of Shame, where they can't be affected by auras. I think, to be honest, unlike the battle traits, I think it's probably best if you roll for these ones myself. If you just literally pick them, then you could usually pick something that isn't that relevant to any one unit in question. Say, for example, a gunland type unit wouldn't care quite as much about walking wounded, as it might not be moving very much. There are also individual unique traits for characters, monsters and vehicles. One of the characters ones is always re-rolling successful hit rolls of 6, and an example one for vehicles is being minus 1 to hit and wound with one weapon on the vehicle. In general, I think that some of the less experienced units won't really mind having a devastating blow, as they might not have got many experience points yet, where your more veteran units might be more keen to take a battle scar rather than lose those experience points. When it comes to actually playing games, you have to select an army from your order of battle, as we've mentioned. You generally take them as battle-forged armies, balanced around the power level of the game that you're playing. Again, this is around the four main sizes of Crusade Mission, which are Combat Patrol, Incursion Strike Force, and Onslaught and they advise that you talk through your opponent through your army roster and explain any abilities, which might be a touch more complex if you have gained quite a lot of abilities. As I mentioned previously, the way that they try and balance these games are by using the crusade points to give a crusade blessing to the army with less. If, say, you have one player who's gained loads and loads of battle honours, their crusade point score will be quite high, whereas a newer army might have very few or even zero. So for every crusade point higher in the more experienced army, then the less experienced army gets that many command points. Potentially, if you were playing a completely new crusade army versus a very experienced one, you could have absolutely tons of command points on the go, I think. I honestly don't think that this is the perfect balance system, really. You could have lots of crusade armies who have taken lots of battle scars that aren't really very meaningful, meaning that they wouldn't really have to pay that many crusade points extra. Or you could have had a crusade army that's taken loads of upgrades, but maybe not necessarily very good ones, meaning that their opponent might have just a crazy advantage in command points, so the game might not be very balanced that way. I think that a bit of a sensible coordination between you and your opponent would still be needed. So in terms of the actual crusade missions themselves, there are 18 in the book, at least fairly similar to the Eternal War ones. 3 for Combat Patrol, 3 for Incursion, 3 for Strike Force, and 3 for Onslaught. In general, they're a little bit more freeform, with some more interesting and different type objectives rather than similar ones for Eternal War. And there's also some asymmetric missions, where the attacker and defender have slightly different roles and deployment zones. They often have the old system of objective placement as well, rather than having fixed objectives as the Eternal War missions have now. The primary objectives tend to be fairly straightforward, not needing quite as much bookkeeping as the Eternal War missions, and there are no secondary objectives. These are instead replaced by something called agendas. The winner of the battle will usually get some sort of upgrades to boosting their units for the next mission. Say for example in this one on the right, the sweep and clear combat patrol mission, you can choose two units to mark for greatness at the end of the game. So you can have two units that gain that additional plus three experience points. After the battle they also run through the order in which you do things such as deal with out of action units, add experience points to your units, add battle honours and combat tallies after each game. It does seem like you're going to have a reasonable amount of bookkeeping when you're playing crusade. These agendas are sort of similar to the secondaries in the Eternal War missions, and you have a similar number for them, where you have one agenda active in Combat Patrol, all the way up to six for a massive Onslaught mission game. A lot of them tend to work by your individual units keeping a tally of the actions they achieve throughout the game, and at the end of the game they might gain a certain amount of experience points, depending on what they've achieved from these tallies. As with the secondaries, there are five categories of them, and you can only pick one from each category. Purge the Enemy has one for assassinating characters, where you'll gain two experience points for each character that you kill. No Mercy, No Respite has one for killing hordes, where you'll gain an experience point for every six models that are killed in one phase. Battlefield Supremacy has a breakthrough one, where if your units manage to finish near your opponent's table edge at the end of the game, then you'll get two experience points for each. Shadow Operations has one where you can use an action to search objectives for Archaeotech. And Warcraft has one called Scry Battle Plans, where you can use psychers to try and steal the battle plans out of enemy characters' minds. It's a psychic action, and if you can manage to do it twice, then you'll gain a pretty impressive 5 experience points. I think it'd be interesting trying to balance winning the game, and maybe trying to keep your units alive so they don't acquire battle scars on things, versus trying to achieve these little side objectives, which could significantly increase the amount of experience that your units get. So I hope you've enjoyed this little rundown of the Crusade game mode. I do think that it will see some decent play. Coming in the main core rulebook is certainly an advantage, and also the slightly more relaxed way compared with other narrative game modes where you might have to think about an entire campaign. 
I think that having the additional faction-specific crusade options that come out in each codex will certainly help keep the game fresh as well, so I'll look forward to seeing what those are like for the first codexes that come out. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where we'll certainly be keeping the reviews coming throughout 9th edition. And if you have been finding my content useful, I'd just like to mention that I do have a Patreon page, which is down in the video description below. If you have been enjoying regularly, then any support is greatly appreciated, as making YouTube videos is now basically my full-time job. Channel Patreons get to see one video a week early, there's regular votes to see what sort of videos you guys would like to see next, and you're also automatically entered in the Allspets Tactics prize giveaway, with a chance to win some decent sized kits each month. If any of that sounds good, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then the link is down in the video description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.